So, Jim? Sure. Uh, my name is Tim Schmieler. You probably don't see me every day. I'm a graduate of this department. I got my PhD here in December of 2001. And uh, two weeks later, I started teaching at the University of Iowa as an assistant professor in mechanical engineering there. Uh, a year and a half after that, I came back here to this department to teach in the mechanical engineering department as an assistant professor. And then almost five years ago now, I left here to teach as an associate professor at the University of Notre Dame, which is where I still am. So I, I am proof that you can get a PhD here at Ohio State and then in seven years get three different faculty positions. <laughs> which I don't necessarily recommend, uh, but it's just the way my career path has, has gone. Um, I came to graduate school with the idea of getting a master's and getting a job, and I found out I liked research too much, and it's ruined my life since. Um, I got a chance to teach when I was a graduate student. I, I love teaching. I love research. I would miss one if I weren't able to do it. Uh, that's true of both of those. And so uh, I really enjoyed my job. I really enjoyed my, my time here as a student and as a faculty member. Uh, I'm very happy with the work I'm currently doing. Uh, my name is Jumi Wong. You probably see me every day. <laughs> I'm a faculty member here for almost five years. Uh, before uh, coming here in 2008, I was uh, with uh, industry at the Southwest Research Institute, where I worked for another five years. So uh, I did my PhD. Actually, uh, it's a little bit of normal experience because my PhD was done in part time while I was working full time. So the reason for that is that when I was in the uh, University of Minnesota working on my PhD, somehow I, uh, I decided to quit my PhD and to work. Right? I'm not not intended to do a faculty position. So after several years in industry, I realized that uh, I may want to be a faculty. Uh, member, so I resumed my PhD program in UT Austin and finished it in 2007, then came here as a faculty member in 2008. So my research primarily on the automotive control, including engine, catalyst, and uh, uh, vehicle chassis, etc. Uh, I very much, like Jim, uh, Professor Smith, uh, I like very much my work here as a faculty member doing research, the major difference compared with industry research in the, I would say, the freedom of research. It's not constrained by any business model or business structure, which are typical in, uh, in industry, even in the research uh, department. But uh, as a faculty member, freedom of research is, uh, is very much appreciated from my, my viewpoint. My name is uh, Dr. Gitandi. I think some of you have uh, seen me, and I think if you're wondering why all the other people are young and I'm the only old guy, it's because, <laughs> because I wasn't told this, but anyway, because uh, I became a faculty member recently. So I, uh, I, I got my PhD in 1989, which is well before all these other people on this point. But then I spent 20 years at Bright Patterson Air Force Base uh, doing research, and it was very exciting. But I always felt that every time I visited a university, and I used to go frequently uh, to, to make presentations, I always felt that there's an energy about academia. And it's permanent because you know students come in, they're always young, and then they go out and they become work somewhere else. <laughs> you don't see them. And, and, but the new ones come, and, they, and the thing about uh, students is the optimism. And you know, whereas when I was at Wright Pat, I used to always feel, oh my god, this is so complex or boring. Here, nothing is boring. Everything gets exciting because, of course, of the attitude of the, of the students. So that's why I decided to become a faculty member. What I actually do, uh, I do primarily computational work. In fact, exclusively computational work. Never got my hands dirty on Greece or anything. So I encourage those of you who don't like to get your hands dirty to, to look at computations. Uh, besides, I break things that I touch. So, but. The thing is that I do computational work. It's primarily um, aerospace, so it's mostly uh, different speed regimes. So it's mostly things like uh, wing stall, you know, these uh, fighter aircraft that go at very high and go for attack, and then they don't uh, they stall, which means it means that. So why does that happen? How do we fix it? Those kinds of things. And then at the high speed end, uh, we do uh, scramjets, hypersonics. 
So we have a large range of speed regimes. We do many different things, and uh, we have a lab upstairs. I encourage any of you who want to come in and see what my students are doing. Come by. Uh, So I'm Rob Siston. I graduated from this department as an undergrad in 2000. I uh, actually had Jim as a professor <laughs> fall of 99, and you'll see this is all, all his fault, which is why I'm up here. Um, hence why I'm wearing a tie. Jim wearing a tie. Uh, in the fall of 99, I was really having a midlife crisis as to what I wanted to do with my career. I was considering going to grad school to do work in biomechanics. mechanics. But at the same time, I was an RA, and I was involved in a bunch of things with, act with activities on campus. So I said, okay, maybe I wanted to be in higher ed or student affairs, because I really like working in a college environment. I like teaching, so maybe I just want to be a high school teacher or something like that. I like the medical side of things, so maybe I just wanted to be a orthopedic surgeon or a doctor or something like that. And I also was considering getting involved in research. So I was really considering four career paths at the same time. So I did some work down all four paths. Eventually I realized that a couple of those options work in my, um, didn't match with my, with my, my personality. And eventually I was looking for a position where I could teach classes, work with students in a collegiate environment and do research on something that I was interested in. Add it all up. That's a that's being a uh, being a a a professor. So I went. I did go go to grad school to do research in biomechanics, doing a lot of work on total knee replacement and knee osteo uh, osteoarthritis. Uh, doing my grad work at Stanford, I decided to stay on for a year. But since my wife and I both graduated from Ohio State. While I was finishing up my PhD, I intended to separate an academic job search from finishing my degree. Then I got an email that said, hey, OSU has a job opening. I said, okay, I have to apply or else I always regret not applying. So I got a call from Professor Karaman three weeks before I defended my PhD. Hey, can you come out and interview? So in May of 2005, I... Uh, Defended my PhD on a Tuesday, flew to Ohio on Wednesday, where my host was Professor Coupe. Uh, interviewed on Thursday and Friday of that week, then flew back to California. A couple weeks later, they told me I did not get the job. They offered it to someone else, only to have get another call back when I was in Hawaii. In fact, the first guy said, no, would you like to come back and join us? So that Hawaiian vacation turned into a really good Hawaiian vacation. <laughs> I came back in 2006, so I've been here since. So I'm uh, Carlos Castro. I'm a, probably, I think, the newest person in the department up on this faculty, on this panel. Is it working? No. <laughs> I'll just, I'll talk loud. Um, so I've been here for almost two years now, and I work also kind of in biomechanics, but at a much, much smaller length scale. Um, so I work kind of at the interface of biomechanics, um, nanotechnology, and I would say also engineering design. Um, so I work a lot <coughs> in uh, DNA nanotechnology and kind of trying to develop devices to do sort of biophysical and biomechanical measurements. Um, okay, this is better. Um, so I am also actually a graduate of Ohio State University, but I graduated in uh, undergrad. I did my bachelor's and master's at Ohio State University. I finished, left Ohio State in 2005, um, went to do my PhD. On, can you just hold that one up? <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Um, so I did my PhD in mechanical engineering at, uh, uh, at MIT, and I finished there in 2009. Um, and that's during my PhD is actually when I started to move into uh, kind of more biological. <laughs> so during my PhD is when I started to move into biological related stuff. During, before that, I obviously did research uh, during my master's degree and undergrad, but actually I did manufacturing research. Um, so I completely changed directions in terms of the research. 
uh, between master's and PhD, and that turned out to be, I think, for me at least, a pretty exciting change. Um, I really like working in the areas of, of uh, biology and biomechanics and kind of nanotechnology. Um, so I finished on my PhD in 2009, and then I actually spent uh, a year and a half as a postdoctoral researcher in Germany. Um, so I spent a year and a half at the Technical University of Munich, um, working actually in a physics, in a biophysics department, but in the physics department there. Um, and then I came back to Ohio State almost two years ago now. In April, it'll be two years. Um, and so I, yeah, I think I also, I, I mean, I, I very much like my job, um, just like everyone else here on this panel. Um, I like research, I like teaching. I initially, I, I wasn't sure from the beginning, I guess I wanted to be faculty. I always, I got involved in research early as an undergraduate, maybe second or third, yeah, I think summer after second year. Um, and I quite liked it, but I also did internships and I quite liked the internships. So I actually applied for, for jobs and graduate school when I was fin finishing up, both when I was finishing my bachelor's and when I was finishing my master's. Um, but in the end, I think I kind of always knew in the back of my head that I would go to graduate school. Um, I just like the idea of being able to do new stuff, not necessarily stuff that someone is telling you to do. Right? So kind of getting to come up with new experiments and new ideas and, and trying to solve new problems and come up with new problems. Um, so that's kind of what I, you know, I liked the research. I also had some teaching experience and liked the teaching. Um, and again, basically academia was a great setting for me to be able to do both of those. Um, and that was my, yeah, why I chose to do what, what we're doing. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, I don't know if they had initial introductions, but I'm Rebecca Dupay. I've had the, about half of you in class already, so you already know me. Um, how I ended up here is I really never wanted to actually be an engineer. And uh, I don't know, I probably would be a pretty good one, but I never really had that interest. I uh, went to college, and they gave me an engineering scholarship. I went to Utah State University, which was in state tuition for me, an hour and a half for my parents. And I looked at math, I looked at physics, I looked at music, I looked at French, all of my different interests, and engineering gave me the best scholarship. So I said, okay, I'll be an engineer. <laughs> and uh, that was the plan. I was approached by several of my professors where I got, when I got A's in their class, they said, why don't you come do research with me? And I said, that doesn't sound interesting. I'd rather spend my spare time playing in the Utah State Symphony and doing my string quartet and all my other interests. So I did no research as an undergrad, and I was, um, had very different life plans. Anyway, my senior year as an undergrad, uh, I had my whole life a little bit disruptive. My family had moved. I was planning to be married, and that fell to pieces. And I had no idea what I was going to do. I had no jobs lined up. I had about a quarter left. One of my professors that I'd had in a couple of classes stopped me in the hall and said, hey, did you ever think about graduate school? And I had never thought about it. It never crossed my mind. And uh, he said, you know, there's this research experience for undergraduates coming up. It's in Maine. My ex fiance lived in California, so Maine sounded like a really good place to go. Um, so I signed up. I flew across the country. I did some really fun research um, in advanced engineering wood composites in their civil engineering department. And you know, by the end of it, I thought, you know, research is actually kind of fun. Just going to the lab and experimenting and trying stuff out and having it fail miserably and trying to dream up explanations for why the data looks like it does. Uh, so I went home, uh, took a temp job, found out I'm terrible at reception work, and uh, ended up sending out applications, uh, got admitted to MIT for grad school. Um, I found a great advisor there at my research and ended up now being in polymers, composites, biological tissues, um, basically any interesting material. I like to understand how it behaves and why. And uh, anyway, at the end of my master's degree, I walked into my PhD advisor, master's advisor at the time, and said, I'm done. I don't, research is fun, but I just don't see a career in it. I don't know that I'm driven in that area, but I really like teaching, so I'm going to go and be a teacher. She said, okay, well, good luck with that. And uh, I, I went out and I literally started sending out applications and I found out that it turns out even with a master's degree in mechanical engineering from MIT, you can't just walk in and teach in a school because you didn't get a teaching degree. And 
And uh, so I talked to some people about it, and I did find a school that was willing to hire me provisionally because they were so desperate for math and science teachers. And then when I walked into the interview, he said, you know, you look like a teacher. I think you do okay here. <laughs> well, to get him to talk to him, I had to walk past the metal detectors and the security guards. This was an inner city school in Boston in a very scary neighborhood. And it turns out I would have been teaching algebra and geometry to a mostly empty classroom of kids who were going to drop out from high school. <laughs> because they needed me to teach there, um, but nobody else would take me because I didn't have a teaching certificate. So I walked, went back to my PhD advisor and said, you think you could keep me on, maybe? Um, she said yes. So I uh, continued my PhD and the whole time you know, thought, I'm still not sure I want to be an engineer. I really like teaching. Um, so toward the end of my PhD, she's like, you know, you'd actually be a pretty good match for academics. So I sent out some applications, not really so sure that anything was going to come of it. And I figured, well, if I don't get a job, a real teaching academic job, I will um, try a postdoc or try a national lab, do something like that for a couple of years and polish my resume. But Ohio State decided they liked something that they saw in my interview. And uh, I came here, and I've been here 10 years ever since. And now that I look back, I don't think there's any other job that I would actually fit in as well. I, like, like some of the other people have said, I love working with students. Um, I love teaching in classes, but I also like the teaching that I get from working one-on-one -on -one with my graduate students. That's probably my favorite part of teaching, is sitting across the table one-on-one, -on -one, looking at what they're doing, and being stumped, having no idea what's wrong, and having us kind of beat our heads against the problem. And that's the favorite, my favorite part of my job. And um, yeah, we might do some really cool research along the way, but I like interacting with students, and so I think it's the best fit I could ever come across, even though I just kind of fell into it by accident. Okay, thank you very much, guys. And uh, are there any questions from the audience at this point? Or are you going to make me ask the questions? Yes? Uh, so, straight to faculty position, postdoc, how do you choose between the two, and what are the differences in the interview processes Anybody? So the question is, should you go straight to faculty position? Should you take a postdoc? Yeah. I would do a postdoc unless you were an absolute superstar. Because things are different now than they were 10 years ago when I took this job. And even then, I really wish I had a postdoc. It gives you this opportunity to really mature as a researcher before you have to do research, teaching, and service all simultaneously. So I would strongly recommend it. Also, you, you can try to, uh, you can expand your research portfolio, not just doing the kind of research your PhD advisor did. You can pick up new skills from a postdoc advisor. Um, it just really is, I strongly advise it for, for anyone considering academic. Yeah, I, I would probably second that. Um, so I had the experience, actually I didn't mention this, but I actually applied for jobs straight out of the PhD, and I was I got actually the job at Ohio State straight out of the PhD, but that was kind of with the understanding that basically I deferred the job for a year to do a postdoc, um, and I ended up extending that deferral to a year and a half. Um, and for me, it was a very, very beneficial experience. What I'm doing now, having done the postdoc, is completely different than what I would have done not having done the postdoc, I mean, research-wise. Um, and I think it is a bit of a chance to mature and sort of mature your ideas and just, you know, get, get yourself a, a new set of expertise, like, like Rebecca said, to differentiate yourself from your advisor and to right, make yourself a little bit more unique and also expand your net Part of, part of it is expanding your network, too, as you get to, get to know a new community. Um, or, or if you do things right, you get to know a new community. And that, that can also be quite important. It depends. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I say it depends because you are sitting in an R1 university that grants PhDs. There is a spectrum of faculty positions at smaller colleges like Rose Holman Institute for Technology or Hope College or places like that, or is primarily focused on undergraduate teaching. So if you want to focus on undergraduate teaching, the, you may have a stronger chance. It, it, the postdoc may or may not help you in that case. If you're going for an R1 university, Ohio State, MIT, Georgia Tech, any of the places that we worked or we went to school at, 
the interview process looks at how many publications you have out already, how many publications are in the process, how many conference abstracts you have. Do you have any grants or are we're ready, you have strong capability to already get grants. So a postdoc gives you that extra year to get more pubs out, get more data for initial grants and things like that. I'm with Carlos. I got the job out of the PhD with the understanding I would stay on for an additional year as a, as a postdoc. Because it was an R1, that extra year got me more experience doing research, getting premium data for grants and that sort of thing. So it depends on where you want to go. If you're going in R1, a postdoc is a great idea. So my, uh, my career has been very different from all the others here. I spent 20 years in a national lab. And uh, it's, it's, so the answer, if I had to give it, would be yes, do something before you go into faculty. Do some kind of research which gives you contacts, how to write proposals, how to think about writing proposals, things like that. Doing my kind of thing is very iffy. If you go to Sandia National Lab or AFRL or whatever, and 20 years later you decide, oh no, I should have gone into faculty, it's not that easy. You have to wait for the right opportunity. And it doesn't always come. And I was very, very fortunate that it came right here at Ohio State. Because if it were anywhere else, I wouldn't have gone because I was very well settled in my other uh, position. So bottom line is, I think directly going from PhD to, to a faculty is doable, but it's tough. Uh, and some people do it if you're a superstar. I think it will do very well regardless. So. My answer would be dependent. It's uh, completely, I think, not completely, but uh, heavily depends on your areas, which areas I mean. For some areas, postdoc experience is a must. For some areas, postdoc experience is a plus. For some areas, postdoc experience may not be necessary. So, uh, especially, I think, suggestion would be you look at the recent hires from your field, from at different universities, see if those new hires, new uh, faculty members had any postal experience. Give you an example, a student of, of mine graduated last year, straight up PhD, and got a faculty position offers and started already last year. So without any postal experience, graduated in June and started in July. So, uh, that what I'm saying is that it really depends on your area. We, we, I would suggest you look at the recent uh, new faculty members from various universities in your field. See how many of them had uh, post or how many of them had, did not have a uh, postal experience. Then you can make your judgment. Just in terms of data, certainly at Notre Dame, we've hired people recently since I've been there in the last four years uh, from both direct to PhD and after postdoc. The two most recent hires we've made have both taken the, the Carlos approach. They've interviewed, they've been extended offers straight out of the PhD and then deferred uh, start dates. An advantage there is you get to go around twice. You can apply for academic positions while you're a PhD student. If you get one that you like, it's a good fit, you take it. And then you, you negotiate the delay for the postdoc. If you don't get any offers that you like, you can still apply again when you're, uh, when you're a postdoc. What you can't do is accept the job, defer it, and then go on the market again. That's, that's another thing. Um, another thing to be wary of is don't do a four-year postdoc. Uh, right? Or don't do three postdocs each of two years. Because while that might be common in biological sciences and engineering, employers are going to say, well, why did he or she have to do a second postdoc? Why isn't he or she already in a faculty position? So that's they start wondering what's wrong with you if you've been in a postdoc too long. But I agree, I think in general postdoc is probably a good idea, but I would apply for the jobs before, at the same, the teaching jobs at the same time you apply for postdoc positions. Other questions? So, as a general guideline, how many, oh, okay. So I just have a question, you know, your comment. So let's say you've been in the postdoc position for two years and you still haven't landed that faculty position, do you recommend then extending for a third year or just taking time off and regrouping or you know, what do you recommend you do? You're not so I would rather extend for a third year provided your postdoc is, is being productive for you as intellectually and in terms of publications. 
Uh, I think getting started in a new postdoc uh, where you're going to have to commit for, you know, to really be productive a year and a half, which is, I think, probably why Carlos extended for a year and a half, because to get the most out of a postdoc, you want to be there probably that long. Um, so my advice would be to extend rather than to take the time off. I would also encourage you to really think 
a, a postdoc is, is basically another opportunity for you to learn, right? So that part, I mean, it's other things too, but I think mainly it's an opportunity for you to learn, right? It's also a resume builder, publishing papers, but you're really basically expanding your foundation for your career, right? So in my case, the, the, I chose a postdoc basically thinking that, okay, I have, I'm a so-called expert in this area where I worked on my PhD, um, right? What, what could I learn that I think would be pretty interesting that would help me establish a lab that's kind of complementary to the stuff that I did? Um, and so that's basically what I, you know, how I tried to choose a postdoc is to think about, okay, you know, I have a year to a year and a half in my case, um, Right, what, what do I want to learn in that year to a year and a half? What do I think is pretty exciting? And what do I think could be a good thing to have going forward right, for searching for funding um, that could also integrate with the stuff that I did before, but is kind of, I was in the same situation where it was different from what I did before, but in the same general, right, in the same general field. So, but I would, I would definitely encourage you to think about what, what do you want to learn? What do you want to learn from a postdoc scientifically, basically? Or what kind of new technologies do you want to pick up that you think might be helpful to you going forward? So that's almost like a postdoc. Right? I think it might even be considered a postdoc at a national lab. You stay for about two or three years and then you leave. So it's very similar to a postdoc insofar as the national lab. Just like they said about other postdocs, if you stay in a national lab for too long, then it becomes harder to leave because for pretty much the same reasons. You know, universities want to find younger people. Once you're there for 10 years, it gets harder to, for, you know, then you have to wait for just the right opportunity. Maybe they have a requirement in a certain area, and you just happen to fit that area, then, then they, they'll, they'll get you. But uh, insofar as the postdoc question goes, you can do a postdoc in the national lab effectively. It's the same, same kind of thing. And in a way, it's not too bad because you make contacts with that national lab agency. And when you leave, you can actually tap into those contacts if you if you're good enough to get funding. So in a way, it's better, but also, you know, the universities always have the excitement, and you miss that, of course. What's the interviewing process like for people who are professors? I'm on a search committee for a faculty member right now, so I'm in the middle of it. Uh, basically, we receive a whole bunch of applications and we spend hours going through them, get it to a short-ish list and then a shorter list. We just did phone interviews this week with our top six candidates. Uh, basically people that we were really interested in, we were going to talk to them on the phone first and we had a standard list of questions that we did not give them in advance, of course, but it was basically, you know, can you explain how your research fits this area we're looking for, who do you think you might collaborate with here, what resources are you thinking you'll need to build a lab, uh, what classes are you interested in teaching? Those kind of questions on the phone. Just a half an hour, well, they were all more like 45 minute um, phone interviews. Um, based on that, we're having a hashed out meeting next week to figure out who to actually invite to campus. We're hoping to only have to invite three people because it's a major time investment to, to rope all the faculty together for seminars and meetings and lunches and breakfasts and dinners. Um, usually it's a, a one to two day process. Um, you'll meet with the department chair, um, dean, the members of the search committee are the people you'll see over and over during the course of those couple of days. Um, you give, hopefully early in the interview, a big seminar, usually a you know, hour-long seminar to primarily faculty, but there may also be graduate students there. It's, it's a chance to showcase how well you communicate, um, what your research is about um, on a very detailed level, but also a big picture level. Uh, give them some idea of where you want to go research-wise down, down the road. The job talk is probably the most important single piece because you're talking to a, 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 most of the people that's the only chance they are to, they're going to have to, to see you and, and they're trying to assess how well you teach, 
what is your research vision, how competent are you to field questions from, from a general or specific audience. Um, and it's hard to prepare for, too, I would say, because you are trying to talk to people who know your field really closely, a couple people in the room, but also all the other faculty who really don't know your field, don't care that much about your field necessarily, but they got to decide if they're going to vote yes or no on your job <coughs> candidacy. Uh, so yeah, so it's, a, it's an exhausting, but really fun two days, because you get to meet all kinds of people that, and talk about all kinds of things you never thought about before. Um, and if you, I, I think, to be, um, going into an interview, if you view it as just a chance to meet a ton of people, learn about their research, um, that's a good way to, to not be so scared about about it, and it, it makes you seem a whole lot more engaging if you're asking really intelligent questions about the person on the other side of, of it's, it's a whirlwind of walking into office after office and meeting all kinds of different people, but it, it can be really fun and exhausting and terrifying all at once. That, that's the basic picture, and then af afterwards sometimes, usually we like one or two of the candidates that we bring in, we might rank order them and decide who we want to go after first or second. Um, it's really a disaster if none of them pan out, but usually the phone interview tries to screen out, screen people who really don't fit or can't communicate well, some of that. Um, yeah, so it is a, it, it's a long day, basically. It's, it's quite a long day. Um, so I, what Rebecca kind of touched on, but I would, when you get to that point, I would encourage you to try to schedule the talk early in the morning rather than later in the day. Um, just because you'll be very, you'll be pretty tired by the end of the day. Um, the other thing that I'll, the one thing I'll just add is a little bit about the faculty application. Um, so essentially, I would say the main component of that is a research proposal, essentially, where you're writing maybe a two-page, two to three-page research proposal. That kind of Jim mentioned earlier. It's basically what you know, how, what what research are you going to do in your lab? What projects are you going to establish? What's your research direction maybe for the next two years, the next five years, and long term? Um, so, and to give you an idea, when I wrote my research proposal for the for the job application, it's something I probably worked on for the time scale of about two months. Um, which I don't know, maybe other people can tell you what they did. But uh, and part of the the job application also um, is you may have a teaching statement also. Um, so I think. For my application, I had a one-page teaching statement. It, it was a bit shorter than the research statement, or maybe it was just one page added to the end of the research statement. Um, but so those are two big things. That the teaching statement is what teaching experience do you have, what classes do you think you could teach, maybe what classes do you think you might want to develop um, as a as a faculty member, um, and then the last part of that. I mean, obviously, there's a CV. There's references. References are quite important. Um, and the last other main part of the application is a cover letter, which is basically in one short letter, maybe what are the three biggest research accomplishments that you have, and maybe one big teaching accomplishment, um, and you know, in a couple sentences, why should they hire you, basically. Um, so I, I, I would say sort of two to three months time scale for getting that together, obviously while you're doing lots of other stuff at the same time, but uh, yeah, that, that was my experience. Uh, I, I chaired a search, Rebecca's chairing it, Jim's, Jim's chaired a search, you get maybe a hundred applications and you try to narrow that down to a short list of people to call and then even a short list of people to actually bring in. So the packet, which is like Carlos said, the CV, research statement, teaching statement, uh, cover letter, and then your referees really help distinguish whether you're going to make that short list. Uh, things I've seen kill people are research that's totally unrelated to what, you're, what the job is saying, but what Jim was alluding to, that the research should be, here's what I'm going to do, here's what the area is, why it's important, specifically what I'm going to do, and who is going to fund it, rather than you have these fancy ideas that maybe get traction or not get traction. So if you're as specific as to I'm going to the NSF, a national lab, the NIH, industry, here's who can pay for this, that helps distinguish you. And in your teaching statement, it should be specific enough that at your particular university, I can teach 3670, 3671, and you start to list courses, and also I can develop these new courses that I see you do not have at your institution, that I can extend what you are doing. 
a lot of philosophy in the teaching statement. Like you love learning, you love inspiring students. Oh, that's great. But concretely, what does that do for you? So the research statement can help you a lot, and your good teaching statement can help you a little. And if you really do those very well, you might get a leg up on 80, 85% of the other applicants. The two days on campus, it's a whirlwind. I think in your question on interview, if you get a call invited to visit the campus, congratulations, that means you know, based on qualifications, you are qualified for the position, probably. So it depends on in-person skill, right? Interview, mainly is looking at how do you communicate? How do you uh, react with questions? How do you present your idea, technical communication capabilities? So that, that is beyond uh, things people can see from your uh, CV or resume. <clears throat> on campus interview is very important, okay, uh, because uh, you, 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 I think it's better to prepare well uh, from all aspects, including uh, what kind of questions you would be expecting, what are what kind of questions you would ask, because you will meet various people from from dean to the chair, to the faculty members, search committees, having breakfast, lunch, dinner. And uh, it's not only technical, but also uh, life side, right? Prepare some questions, uh, location-wise, weather-wise. Um, basically, especially, it depends on your personality. If you meet with, uh, you know, with new people, new faculty members, especially when you uh, out of, or even before your graduation, right? Some of you can go to interview before you, before you get your PhD degree. So then you can talk with, sit on a table, have dinner or breakfast with the faculty members. They might be silent at the time, but you should avoid that. Okay, try to prepare some questions. People can easily talk. Um, that's a trick I would suggest you think about, because that is a lesson I learned. Right? In 2007, before I graduated, I visited the University of Minnesota. They called me back to interview. Then, then I had no, that, no idea what is the campus visit. I had no idea to do faculty interview. Then basically I was having dinner, breakfast, lunch with all the professors I took courses with. So, no idea, okay? So, <laughs> field interview. <laughs> basically field the interview. Then second year, however, luckily in 2008, I learned a lot from that experience. In 2008, I successfully uh, secured them quite a few positions. So be well prepared, not only technical, but also from the other perspectives, okay? You know, think about what are you are going to talk, or what kind of questions you may ask, and make sure all those communications and person-in-person -person, in -person interactions are very well handled, because that's uh, another aspect people are looking at from uh, on-campus I think that's an excellent point. I mean, these people are trying to decide if they want to serve in a committee with you in 30 years. Because if you get tenure, they're going to be around you for 30 years. And so the seminar is the most important. You already heard that. The second most important event at the interview is dinner. Just dinner. Because at breakfast, they assume you're getting ready for the day. At lunch, they assume you're in the middle of work mode. At dinner, they assume you are more relaxed and you are being your real self. When I interviewed, uh, candidate when I was briefly at the University of Iowa, we had already decided to offer her the job. Her interview was over, she was flying out the next day, three of us took her to dinner. She made a racially insensitive comment at dinner, and we all looked at each other like, no! <laughs> she just lost the job. With one sentence at dinner, she lost the job. We're like, we should just stop eating now and go home. This is useless. You need to be yourself but be yourself on purpose at meals. Because that's when people assume you let your guard down and you are being your true self. And that's when they'll ask you things that they can't legally ask you. <laughs> are you married? Do you have children? Are you a one or a two body problem? Right? These are illegal questions, but they just come up at dinner. It's, it's nice, it's, it's casual dinner conversation. Dinner is the second most important part of the interview. The other thing I would say is, uh, related to what Junmin was saying, uh, 
the interview is a dance, and you, both partners are basically deciding, do we want to dance together again, right? And so the university is deciding, is this someone I want to dance with for 30 years? If you're good enough to get the interview, it should be a situation of you determining whether you want to dance with the university for 30 years too. And you need to act, not arrogant, but act like you belong there, and you are evaluating them for the fit for yourself as much as they're evaluating you as a fit for them. Other questions? Yes, go ahead. I guess you've been saying a few different things that you negotiated when you actually get the position, like taking a year and a half for a postdoc and things. What things are actually on the table to negotiate? <laughs> All right, I, I, I can start in the middle. Uh, not football seats. Uh, some people have tried to negotiate football tickets and been told no. no. Uh, a, a lot more than what you think. Uh, you should negotiate, it, so a couple things you should negotiate is a release from teaching. So I believe Juneman and Carlos got a quarter off teaching somehow early in their career so that you're here on campus, you're getting your lab set up, you negotiated a quarter off teaching. I did not know that. First quarter here, I was immediately teaching. So some sort of release from teaching, whether it's completely off or reduced load from teaching for a certain amount of time. Uh, you're negotiating lab space, and then you're negotiating essentially cash. So you're nego negotiating cash to buy equipment for your lab, to buy computers, to support graduate students to get time on a supercomputer, get time in an MR scanner, to get all this other stuff. So you should be able to come up with a list of needs that will carry you for several years in all aspects of what you're doing. I need a, a equipment, this equipment in the lab, people to use the equipment, to travel to conferences, to do all this other stuff, to pay myself summer salary for a couple summers while I get released from teaching, so it's going to cost me X. And as long as you can come up with a reasonable X that you can justify, you have a negotiating point. Say you want $5 million, well everyone wants $5 million. But if you're coming in with a legitimately, my needs are based on these equipment with these goals, and I need so much lab space because here's what I need, here's what I need to be productive, then you start to have that conversation. Yeah, the things that are most important and most negotiable are related to getting your research program going. So it's startup funds and it's lab space. And recognize you're not going to get as much lab space as you're promised, <laughs> even if it's in writing. So, but you have to make the case. You know, there are some faculty who will require a million and a half dollar startup package because they can't do their research without an MRI machine. And then there are computational people who can you potentially use a cluster that's already on campus and may have you know, a startup package that's more like $150,000. Uh, you need to make the case for the, the funds you need. Grad student support is often standard, uh, but you should ask about it. Teaching load is often standard, but you should ask about it. Salary is very negotiable, particularly if you talk to your current department chair and say, hey, can you give me the data on the average salary for starting faculty in the Big Ten Plus? department chair here will have that data. When I graduated from here, my department chair gave it to me, and I was able to tell the department chair at Iowa that his number was significantly smaller than the average salary in his own conference from the previous year. He argued with me, and I told him I had the data, and my salary offer went up. <laughs> when I went to Notre Dame, my department chair here was kind enough to make a counter offer when I was choosing to leave that increase the offer of my salary at Notre Dame. So salary is, is a negotiable thing, but at a public institution, it's maybe less negotiable because it's public. Everyone's going to know. And if, the assistant, if you give a new hired assistant professor a huge incoming salary, the other assistant professors are going to see it in the publication the next year, and they're going to come back to the department chair's door and be like, um, my record is stronger than this one. Why? And so there, there are some constraints there. The most important thing for yourself is are you getting the dedication of lab space and funding to get your research program started? And you have to make those legitimate. And then 
I think it's an alarm to you if the other offers of grad student support, summer salary, teaching load, are not in line with what you expected because that may tell you something about the level of support that the department has to offer. Just real quick again, in terms of salary, you want to know all our salaries, it's, it's, uh, it's online. So uh, it's a, at Ohio State we're a public institution, you can look online for us past couple years or go to the main library and our salaries is right there. So what I actually did is my wife went to the library, looked up the salaries of, of current assistant professors. I got a band, so when I sat down to negotiate with my chair, I had the numbers in my head of what current assistant professors were making in that department. As long as I was competitive with that, I could have a, a negotiating standpoint. So having the data from somewhere, whether it's the department chair or you go and look it up, helps you. So the a couple little things that I'd add. Um, one other thing that's negotiable is your starting date. Um, and I would, you might not think so, but that's pretty important. I, I would think carefully about that. And the best thing to do for that is ask people at the, at the institution. All right, so usually the institution will have a set time when the tenure clock starts. So depending on when you start, you may basically lose or gain six months, 10 months, eight months on your tenure clock. So that's an important thing to think about. Um, the other thing I would say is to think about, uh, so Rob, Rob was right, that I, I basically had a, a break from teaching for one, one, well we were on quarters at the time, for one quarter, uh, but I didn't take it right away. So I, I took it, I taught, I came here in April and taught spring quarter, um, and then I took the fall quarter off, which turned out for me to be a very good idea because basically that whole first quarter I was just kind of getting my feet on the ground. And I didn't have any, any equipment in my lab. I didn't really have anything in my lab. Right? I had a room and nothing to do with it just yet. So, except for standing there by myself. <laughs> um, so I, I would also think about maybe if it makes sense for you to maybe teach the first term and then try to take the second term off. And so for me, I think that worked out quite well. And, and yeah, also, also the starting date is something to think about. Well, just one more comment in terms of startup package and negotiation. It also depends on the university. Okay? It's not the different university give different sizes in terms of startup. You, you, you may not expect a teaching school give you a huge amount of startup. That's not reasonable. So you looking for faculty positions, those should be correlated. Typically. Actually, well, one more thing. When you negotiate your startup package, kind of the same thing what they said, but basically you should have some kind of itemized list that, especially if you're an experimentalist, right? I'm an experimentalist. You should have an itemized list that says, this instrument is gonna cost 20,000, right? This is gonna cost me 30,000. This is gonna cost me 1,000. I need, right, materials and supplies for one year is gonna cost me 20,000 per student. Um, right, so you'll have a list from 1 to 50 maybe with right, how much does each item cost. And some of that stuff you won't know, right? Summer salary you might not know, student support you might not know. But you should think about putting that in that list and just ask the department, right, how, how much does this cost, how much does this cost if you don't know. Right, computers, software is another thing to think about. Software can be quite expensive, right, 10,000, 15,000 for certain softwares. Um, so you really should have an itemized list and one good thing to do is to ask people who you might know who recently got faculty jobs for their startup package list who might be in a similar field. And that list needs to match up perfectly with your research plan. So just write them at the same time. Right? Because if you're proposing to do these three projects, if the equipment to do those projects are not in your request, there's confusion. And if you're asking for equipment you didn't propose to do any research with, there's going to be an issue. So that just do those at the same time. So one last question. Yes. We talked a little bit more about the whole deferral process. Are there some positions where a deferral isn't available? Some schools probably have that. Uh, but most places, every place I've been has looked for a start date 
that's kind of soft. We need somebody in about this time frame, and unless it's a situation where the state funds are going to disappear if they don't have the position filled, uh, most people will wait for you. I think the, I mean, like Rebecca kind of touched on already, the academic interview process, it, it's quite a big investment for the institution as well as for you. So if they decide to hire you and you decide to take the job, I think usually people, they're flexible. I mean, if you say you want to take five years, then probably not. But a year, you know, a year, like I said, I, I mean, I was a year and then I said, can I take six more months? And they said, yeah, sure. And as long as I think you can make the case that that experience is going to help you going forward, then I think they should, generally will be flexible at, at a research institution. You, you can't delay the backpack across, you know, Thailand or something. Okay, one, one last question. Go ahead. I was going to say, what other resources here at Ohio State are available to learn more about uh, teaching? <laughs> yeah. What's your question? Sorry. What other what resources are available here at Ohio State for us to go to ask questions to learn more about becoming a faculty member? Is there anything? You're the advisor. Advisor is the best place. I would think so. What's the case? Uh, I, 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 honestly, the best person is your advisor. I believe. UCAT or some of those other types of uh, offices on campus have held seminar series about how to give the job talk, how to prepare a research statement, how to prepare a teaching statement. So they give workshops on the process. It's really your uh, advisor, the most important resource. Or other faculty. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I would say I, to we'll think about other faculty too. That's great. Faculty that you had in class. A faculty that you know from whatever functions. These five people. <laughs> Schwedler at ND. <laughs> Send him emails. <laughs> the more, the, your advisor's got a, a very good perspective. That's the first place to start. But the more opinions you get, you're going to get a little different nuance from everybody. You're going to be better prepared. Have some colleagues in, in your lab look at your research and teaching statements. Have your advisor and a couple other faculty if, if, you, if you know them well enough uh, to ask them. Okay, so well thank you very much to everybody and I want